the, the interesting thing about where we are right now in Congress and in this country in terms of criminal justice reform, part of it is the synergy we have with the different groups that are together. When you have the NAACP and the ACLU on the same side as Koch Industries and uh, Newt Gingrich and others, it shows that we can come together for a common purpose. And I think that common purpose is the fact that one, uh, we're misguided in our policies, and two, the country's less safe today than it was before we started enacting those. So uh, in a uh, really academic term, term, you would say with incarceration in this country, we really have uh, reached the point of the law of diminishing returns. Every penny, every dollar that we spend on incarceration actually makes the country less safe than if we didn't spend it on incarceration. That's why in Congress right now, we're taking a hard look at mandatory minimum sentences through a number of efforts. But the thing that I would urge the audience to do is, uh, and the, the activists and the fact that you're here is the fact that you have a passion for this, is to stay involved and speak now more than you have before. Because of all of the synergy and because of a lot of the work of the Koch Foundation and Institute, we have a chance to do something really, really big. But it takes courage to do something big. And I'm afraid that Congress will take the easy way out and do something really small when we have the opportunity to come together and hold hands and do something that can transform this country. A part of the problem in Congress is that you live in two-year election cycles and you're always running. Uh, in my district, it's easy for me to talk about criminal justice reform. It's easy for me to be on the very aggressive side of criminal justice reform. But for a lot of my colleagues, uh, it's not. And you have to recognize the atmosphere in which you work and understand uh, their districts also. But if we take this same group in the same synergy and we go out to all communities and we and we advocate for it everywhere uh, not just families who are affected uh, not just people who have friends and family uh, incarcerated but also with victims and I think that if we can push that we make this a little less dangerous of an issue for those people who are scared of it for far too long and you know this mistake in terms of our criminal justice system does not have a name on it. It does not have a party affiliation on it. What it has on it is a misguided philosophy. And we turned a slogan into public policy. You know, tough on crime was a slogan. We didn't actually mean to legislate it. So now, you, so now we actually took tough on crime and turned it into a number of things. But what it really is, in, in my estimation is the climax of foolishness. Uh, we are, and we have uh, taken all rhyme and reason out of the criminal justice system. And I think that that's the important part of where we put it back in. And I'll just give you a short story just to show you why I call it foolishness. Uh, and my mother would kill me for using that word too. But in 2000, I was elected to the state legislature. We went have a hearing in 2001 on mandatory minimum sentences at Angola uh, State Penitentiary, which used to be the most violent penitentiary in America. So we're having a hearing. At the time, I am 26, 27 years old. And we're debating because in Louisiana, in the first heroin uptick and, and crisis, Louisiana passed a law that on your first uh, conviction for distribution of heroin, you get life in jail. And it became natural life. So we're having a hearing and all of these older men that were in their 50s, 55, they were coming to the table and they're like, look, I was an addict, I don't deny it. But the police came to me, they said, hey, can you, do you have heroin? And they said, no, I don't, I know where to get it. They said, well, if I give you $20, will you go get two, uh, two dimes for us? And so the ones that actually went out and got it and were crazy enough or honest enough to come back and give the other one to the uh, detective got arrested and convicted for distribution. And now we're serving natural life. So I'm listening to these stories. And then a guy comes up who's very, very articulate. And he said, uh, State Representative, panel, I just want you to know that I am home. 
I, am, I have a body shop. I employ eight people. And if these guys got a chance for probation or parole, or parole in the future, parole eligibility, I would hire these guys because I know them. And they've been in here, and a lot of them have been in there longer than I have been alive for one conviction, distribution of heroin. So I was so impressed with the guy, silly me. I said, well, what did you do if you're out and they're still in? He said, oh, I shot a cop. And I, I started sitting back and I said, wait, let me get this straight. You shot a police officer. He said, yeah, the maximum on shooting a police officer was 50 years. I said, so you shot a police officer and you're home. They were addicted to heroin and they're gonna die in prison? And that was the law of Louisiana. And after five years of introducing legislation to attempt to give those what we called heroin lifers parole eligibility, we did it. And now I think all but two are home because of trying to figure out how to help them. But I think that that example goes to show the overreaction to drug addiction, the overreaction to uh, epidemics that are going and not putting data and evidence-based uh, science behind what we do. And I think that, you know, in a state, you can't tell me the life of a police officer uh, is less important than addiction to heroin. And so that, I think, is the sentiment of what we're dealing with across the country. But the good news is that I think that we have finally reached that point where fiscal conservatives realize that it, we can't sustain spending this much money. I think criminal justice experts realize that uh, the money we're spending, we're really throwing good money after bad when we can prevent crime instead of dealing with it on the back end. And people are really coming together. And, and let me just talk, and I talked about that story, uh, but let me talk about the good things. Uh, the good things are happening around criminal justice reform. And one of the things we have happening here, and I don't see him in the room, there's a guy named Norris Henderson and, and his group in New Orleans, they founded something called First 72. Uh, and Norris has been a tremendous friend. But people, formerly incarcerated people, are starting to really get involved to help other people that are coming home, whether it's through Ban the Box, whether it's through housing programs, whether it's through helping them with uh, workforce reentry and all of those things. We are now talking to the people who are not only the subject matter experts because they've studied it while being incarcerated, but they also lived it. When I was chair of the Judiciary Committee, everyone wanted to talk about reentry. How do we best do it? So I said, if we want to talk about reentry, let's do it. So I had a criminal justice committee hearing or a Judiciary Committee hearing, and I only invited formerly incarcerated people to testify. Because unless you're talking to them and involve them in the process, you don't know the little things. So for example, we learned that when they got out of jail, they got a bus ticket home and they got $10. Well, the first requirement for them to legally be citizens was to have a ID, which cost $12. So when you sent them home, you sent them home with the only proposition is finding $2 so that you can be compliant with the law or walk around with an ID and not be compliant. And then we figured out that they would go to jail on sometimes serious crimes and do serious, you know, do a couple years, but they would come home with all of these lingering traffic fines and traffic tickets and suspended license. Well, you know, don't get me wrong, like for me, if I don't pay a parking ticket, suspend my license and, you know, I'm gonna go pay it. But for a guy who just spent two or three years in jail or four or five or 10, I think that five years probably paid the debt of any parking ticket also. So we should wipe that clean as people start to come home. So part of our challenge while we do criminal justice reform and we look at the big picture of sentencing and, and police reform and all of those things is also looking at the small things that keep people from being successful when they come home because it doesn't make sense to, re to reform the system if we don't create the environment in which we know they can succeed because what you will have a, is a self-fulfilling prophecy if you let people out of incarceration but you don't give them a meaningful opportunities to become a part of society and to support their families. And the thing I'll close on, because I really want to take questions so we can have more of a, uh, of a back and forth, is that for far too long we looked at incarceration as 
the person that's incarcerated is the person we're trying to punish. And that's the person we're trying to reform. And that's the person we're dealing with. But it was a juvenile court judge, Judge Ernestine Gray from New Orleans, great woman. Uh, she said, Cedric, people don't realize that, yeah, daddy may be in jail, but it's the children and the family that's doing the time. And now we have seen the breakdown of the family unit. Uh, a lot of it is because of incarceration. And the fact is, the overwhelming majority of people that we send to prison are coming home. And we need to make sure that they don't go back. And we need to make sure that when they come home, they are part of the solution and not part of the problem. Because when they come home, the overwhelming majority want to be part of a solution. And they want to make their neighborhoods better. They want to make their families better. And they want to talk to young folks to keep them from making the same mistakes they make. And as I talk to incarcerated people all the time, that's one of the things they always hit on. How can I help other people not to make the mistake I made? Two things, we can't talk about criminal justice reform without talking about this country's lack of focus, lack of attention, lack of funding, lack of commitment to mental health challenges in this country. You can't deal with, you can't deal with real criminal justice reform without dealing with reforming how we treat mental health because you have, you have well-intentioned, good people who have mental challenges that we're not treating and then they become an issue. And we see it every day and we have to deal with it. And two, the federal government has to get out of its own way sometimes. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a drug that really helps with opioid and heroin addiction. But we have all these regulations before you can do it. So you have to go get certified. Then when you get certified, you become an expert on it and you really have the ability to help people beat a heroin addiction, guess what? You can only have 100 patients. Well, we have far more than 100 people in communities addicted to heroin. And it's such a strong addiction that if we're gonna do it, then let's have every tool in our toolkit available for us to use. So part of that is getting government out the way, looking at new innovative ideas, and reforming the system in terms of people who should not be incarcerated uh, should not be looking at specialty courts, diversion programs, and all of those. So with that, uh, I think we should just figure out what you want to talk about as opposed to me thinking about what you want to talk about. Right there. Right there. Thank you so much, Congressman. So we've got a microphone set up right there. And I think we've got people lining up. Let's take a question. I want to say thank you for coming. And I represent uh, Reentry Solutions, a nonprofit out of Alexandria, Louisiana. We've been providing services for the last five and a half years. My question to you and my concern to you is that um, I'm not sure if you are aware, GEO is the world's largest private prison management company. Um, they are here in Louisiana, and there is a strong push on their behalf to go into the reentry services. Um, recently, they were awarded all of our day reporting centers in, um, in, our, in our state. Long and short story of it is, is nonprofits were overlooked for this opportunity that have been on the ground doing the work, struggling to do the work. I need to make sure that you are aware that this entity whose stocks is more than Walmart, whose quarterly projections are in the triple digits millions, are not only making money on them when they're in, but now they are holding the, the gateway to breaking the cycle of return for these persons. To me, there's an obvious conflict of interest. We cannot, as nonprofits, compete with the dollars that they have. Well, Congressman, you have any thoughts on that? I do, and I think that that is a conversation that is actually getting some attention on the federal level in the presidential race, and uh, I will tell you that we are looking into, in some of our federal contracts, there's actually a, uh, you know, it's not the hospitality industry, but they actually have a, uh, not attendance, but a, a bed quota in terms of how full they will, uh, they will keep mm -hmm. some of our privatized facilities. But the, the bigger point you make is that you cannot go into the community and help people re-enter the community in spite of the community. Mm -hmm. 
they have to be involved in the process because they're going to know things. They're going to have the, more of an ability to create a nurturing network and keep the families involved as, the, as people reenter. And even if it's halfway or whether it's residential, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But you have to have community groups yes. involved, whether it's nonprofits, whether it's the church, whether mm -hmm. it's social organizations. Mm -hmm. You cannot come in with a top-down approach mm -hmm. on an issue like this because this is more of an issue of family network. And what we find and what I find is that those smaller groups like First 72, they are so vested in, in it that they go above and beyond to make sure that things get done and that, uh, that the success is the goal. So I take your point, you're absolutely right. And uh, this is not political, but I think that in January, whoever the governor is in Louisiana, we will have a different philosophy on that. Thank you so much for your question. Next. Yes, uh, my name is Doug Colbert. I'm a law professor at Maryland Law School. Um, my law students represent people who are in jail. They're in jail because they can't afford the bail. Other people get out of jail by paying the bail bondsman a non-refundable 10% fee. I'm sure here in Louisiana and New Orleans, you're well aware of the power of the bail bondsman. I'm just wondering, we had a recommendation that never made it to the legislature. The recommendation came from a broad-based community saying we should eliminate money bail because it discriminates against the poor and it favors the well-to-do people. We also called for the elimination of bail bondsmen. Do you ever see a day when people's freedom will be decided on factors other than how much money they have? Well, I think that we have transformed the bail system through the judges into something it was not. Uh, I think that far too often they look at uh, bail as uh, how bad the person is and all of those things. And the truth of the matter is bail is simply to guarantee that you show up in court. And because of that, it's morphed into something else. Uh, no, we should not have debtor prisons because you can't get out. Here in Louisiana, what we find that if you're well to do, you get a judge to release you on your own recognizance. They will just simply let you sign out on your, your signature. And if you're poor, uh, you're gonna get a higher bail. But I do think in cases of, of armed robbery, murder, and things like that, that you should have something that guarantees that they show back up to court. And the question becomes, if you don't have a bail system, uh, and I think you have to reform the bail system tremendously, but if you don't have a bail system, if they don't show up to court, who's looking for them? And if you tell me it's the police, well, the police are inundated, at least in New Orleans, because we're probably 600 officers short. Uh, the question is, who's looking for that person to make sure that they show back up to court? But I think there are uh, major ways for reform in the system from remembering what its purpose and what it was designed to do and making sure that you do an actual risk assessment on a person before you set it. And far too often, we just look and say, oh, this person's charged with this. I'm going to throw him a high bail so I'll look tough on crime, as opposed to saying his mom and dad are both in court, uh, he's stable, he has a job, and he ought to be released. And what we're doing is we are exacerbating problems. So if I get arrested, and we see it all the time in New Orleans, if I get arrested on a minor crime and you give me a high bail, I'm going to miss work the next day. Then I'm going to miss it the next day. And then all of a sudden, I come home after four days without a job, and find myself in a position where I can't get employed because now I have an arrest. So we have to find some middle grounds. And there's a working group down here on trying to figure out the reform and the right fit. I agree with everything you're saying. I'm just wondering, risk assessment has been so strongly opposed by the bail bond industry because it cuts into their business and profits. Would you favor eliminating the commercial and private bail bondsmen? I would have to see what system you were replaced with. I don't think you can completely re replace it with risk assessment. Let's, let's move on to our next questioner. I think I see Sidney Powell there. Yeah. Hi. The Department of Justice has a history of opposing criminal justice reform, evidenced by their Killing the Fairness and Disclosure of Evidence Act that, as far as I know, had the support of every organization represented in this room. The only opposition to it was by the Department of Justice. What do you see as the major obstacles right now to criminal justice reform, and has the department changed its position in any way? Uh, what we're seeing now is not the department itself. 
because I think they get their instructions top down. And the last Attorney General Eric Holder was, I think, committed to a smarter approach to criminal justice. Uh, now I think that you have people that are entrenched in the system who don't want to see change. And so now we have, as opposition, the Association of Assistant U.S. Attorneys, who, which, you know, I don't understand it because I'm just a simple public school guy. If I'm the Attorney General, I don't think my assistant AUSAs around the country would, would galvanize to be against something I'm for. Uh, and then you have just district attorneys, I think, around the country who have a lot more influence than uh, we recognize who are an obstacle because they don't want to see things change. And they, if they see it at the federal level, they think it would trickle down to the state level. But some states like Texas are actually leading the, the charge on it. Sydney, I'm so sorry, but I'm getting the notice that we've got to get to our last two questioners here. So let's go ahead and get to the, the next one. So my question is a fascinating follow-up to Sydney's question and perhaps a little bit awkward for me since I'm the United States Attorney in Birmingham, Terry Sewell's <laughs> district. Um, and really my question partially contains a, a comment, which is a suggestion to everyone in the room, everyone committed to doing this work to consider engaging prosecutors as partners. As you know, in the department, we now operate under smart on crime policies. My office in Birmingham was the first office in the country to have a federal prosecutor, an AUSA, who instead of carrying a caseload, is our reentry prosecutor. His work is ex-offender reentry with a healthy uh, side dose of prevention work. There's now a reentry slot in every US attorney's office in the country. And by and large, we are very committed to this idea of criminal justice reform. With that commitment, though, and, and here's the question part of, of my comment, with that commitment comes a public outcry that smart on crime is really soft on crime. What I perceive as a commitment to use our resources responsibly to do the most significant federal crime in our district often is reflected in lower statistics. We may prosecute 10% fewer cases this year than we did in, in previous years because we're doing more difficult, more important prosecutions. I'm a federal prosecutor. I don't have to stand for re-election, so I have the luxury of doing the right thing. For my colleagues in the state system, even those who feel in their blood the need to do this sort of work and people who are concerned about overcriminalization, it's more difficult for them, I think, because they do stand for re-election. So my question is, how do we fulfill the promise in the prosecutorial partnerships for this work with people who still have to live with the reality of the political system? Well, I think if you give the federal prosecutors, if, if they can give cover to your elected state district attorneys and other, if they stand up, federal prosecutors are highly regarded in every community. And if, uh, if our assistant U.S. attorneys and, and U.S. attorneys across the country uh, bought in and stood up, then it would be very easy for the district attorneys in those areas to follow their lead. Now, I understand what you're saying, and, and exactly what the first question, you can't implement something top down without talking to the people who actually implement it. So all of the criminal justice reform bills that we have, uh, I will email to our uh, U.S. attorney and our assistant, U and our former U.S. attorney, just to ask them for their feedback. Is it practical? You know, does it make sense? So you have to be at the table. But as we talk about criminal justice reform, one of the things we do have to look at, and no one talks about, is diversion and our prosecutorial discretion to make sure that not just the affluent and the, you know, that we take chances on people in that process also. Because what I find, and I used to do criminal defense work, was that most of my clients who were poor or minority were not you know, no one wanted to take a leap of faith and help them through the diversion process because everybody's scared of the next Willie Horton or, or whatever. So that is something that we are uh, very conscious of in trying to figure out how to uh, deal with that. And just so you know, I actually passed the legislation in Louisiana that created reentry court here that is doing very, very well. Representative Madden, if you can be really, really quick, we'll take uh, one last I question. I tend to be very, very brief for comments. Thank you. Uh, uh, talking about federal issues and federal legislation. Can you give us a prognostication on those pieces of legislation that are 
basically this, the right on crime type activities that we have going on uh, in the federal legislation and also the funding, the things like the second chance reauthorization money, the justice reinvestment money and things like that. Can you give me a status on where they are and what's happening? Well, if I had, if it was just my pick, I would pick for the Safe Justice Act to pass because I think it creates the most comprehensive approach, saves the most money, and then it takes that money and reinvests in all of the things that uh, I think make the country safer. And it incorporates Youth Promise Act and to some extent the Second Chance Act. Uh, but if you look at the bill, the, the Senate bill that's out now and the Goodlatte bill that's out right now, they're both small. And there's a commitment that we will do more follow-up bills. But my thing in Congress, I think it's naive to think that members are gonna take eight hard votes on criminal justice reform bills when uh, it's hard to get them to take one. So my approach on this is not the, how do you get in, you know, eat an elephant one bite at a time. I think with this, you actually have to have one bill that everybody in the country gives everybody cover on. And we have to make sure it's a good bill, but if you have Coke and Heritage and Newt and everybody on one side saying, this is good, and then on the other side, you have the NAACP, ACLU, and others in Urban League saying, uh, this is good, then you can get that one comprehensive bill. My fear is that we just don't have the courage in Congress to do it in a bunch of small bills and, and pass it. So what you will see, and I think we're gonna mark up the good lad bill coming up this week. Uh, well, we're off this week and then the next week. I think you will see a, a process to amend it to make it a better bill. But if you look at the data, the question becomes, at the end of 20 years, are more people incarcerated because of this bill or less? And the truth of the matter is, no one knows the answer to it. And the, the data that we looked at is very, very questionable that the net is not as deep it used, as it used to be, but it could be wider. And because of that, you may have more people uh, incarcerated. So part of it is just making sure that we get to where we want to be. Now, I will close with this because I've said a lot, but I do want to say this. The people working on it, uh, both sides of the aisle, from our very conservatives like Trey Gowdy to our very liberal like Bobby Scott, everybody on this issue is well-intended and trying to get to the right answer. So it has made working across the aisle on this issue very, very easy. And Gowdy's one of my good friends, and it's very funny that he can lead the Benghazi hearing then leave that and come talk to me about criminal justice reform. But it's showing where criminal justice reform is in the country, and people really are trying to get it right. And it's been wrong for so long that it's going to take shifting the mindsets of a bunch of people in order to do it. And, and I'll, last thing I promise, we, we cannot let politicians run anymore on the you're weak on crime, the you're letting prisoners out of jail. We need to make them defend it. We need to make them talk about how they're gonna fund it. We need to make them do all of those things because if we allow them to run the commercials and talk about it without justifying it, we're gonna set the cause back two to five years because you'll only be able to do it the first year of everybody's term and it's two year term. So we as a community have to not let people change the conversation and the dynamic, and we have to stand up to them. Well, I just want to clarify that uh, it's great to have the congressman here talking about his thoughts on policy and legislation and what's happening in Congress, but we are a 501c3, and the Charles Koch Institute doesn't take any particular positions on any particular bills, but we did really enjoy having you here talking about your thoughts on what's happening yeah. up on the Hill. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.